Welcome everyone to California State University, Dominguez Hills. Before I continue, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that our campus sits on the traditional lands of the Tongva people. I give thanks for the care and the protection that the Tongva people continue to provide for these lands. I'd also like to acknowledge as an ongoing dispute between the Tongva people and one of our sister campuses regarding Pavungba, one of their most sacred sites, which is located on the grounds of Cal State Long Beach. My name is Chimena Sid. I'm a Chicana Yaki physics professor and the chair of the physics department at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I'm told that I'm likely the first indigenous person to chair a physics department in the country. I'm also one of very few Chicanas or Latinas to do the same. When I began thinking about what I wanted to say for this talk, I had all these grand ideas and inspirational thoughts that I wanted to share. And when I sat down to actually collect my thoughts, I realized that I'm struggling right now. I'm struggling with understanding how we continue to live in a country that is often described as the most scientifically advanced in the world. And yet we have hundreds of thousands of people who have died and even more who have been infected and or impacted by COVID-19. I'm struggling with the simple act of breathing right now because the entire West Coast is burning due to climate change and the erasure of indigenous land management knowledge. I'm struggling with the violence and the murder that our black and brown communities continue to experience. And honestly, I'm struggling with finding ways to remind myself that I live in a country that I'm supposed to be proud of. As an expert who understands inequities that impact traditionally underserved populations in our educational system, I'm also struggling with the fact that all of these inequities are on superpower mode. So how can I be inspiring for others when I'm struggling daily with all of these realities? Many of us are struggling and I wanted to acknowledge and honor that struggle. My partner is a clinical psychologist and in contrast to me and my daily struggles, he's relatively fine. When I see his level of comfort, it really perplexes me. I keep thinking, how is he doing so well when I feel like I'm having daily breakdowns? And we had a really good conversation and I'd like to share some of that with all of you today. This pandemic has forced us to lead a much different life, a much simpler life. We have removed many of our daily distractions. My own therapist has also welcomed the simpler way of being and both of them have expressed that we have an opportunity to really listen to ourselves and reconnect with who we are. I've embraced that challenge and I'm learning to listen to myself more. I'm learning to acknowledge my accomplishments and my daily wins. I'm also learning to appreciate my struggles. My past struggles have made me the person I am today and my current struggles will continue to make me the person that I will become. So instead of trying to be inspiring, I decided to just be real and to talk about the struggles and to flow with them instead of resisting them. Let me be clear though, it's easier to talk about struggles when we are on the other side of them as opposed to when we are in the middle of them. So let me take a step back and share some of the struggles that I've learned from that have made me the person that I am today. As one of you for all the boxes that I can check, I've had my share of challenges. Every department I've been a part of, including my current department, has come with challenges. Some of them are unique to the department, but many of them are experienced by other black, indigenous women and people of color. These shared experiences include being subjected to racist and sexist behaviors. It includes micro and macro aggressions. I have felt the intense loneliness of being the only woman, the only person of color, and or the intersection of both. Additionally, I've also experienced the harshness of being hyper visible and being tokenized for promotional materials. I've had experienced the invisibility of not being heard or being talked over by my white male peers and colleagues. This hypervisibility and invisibility duality is not unique to me, but experienced by many of us. So how do we learn from these things? Instead of trying to teach you all of the things that I know, I wanted to share myself with all of you, and hopefully from that, you'll be able to pick out some lessons that resonate with you. So who am I, and where do I come from? I was born and raised in Sacramento, California, and grew up in a very socially conscious family. My parents immersed me and my brothers and sisters in the Chicano and American Indian civil rights movements. We boycotted and marched with Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, and the United Farm Workers Union. In Northern California, my father and my tios often served as bodyguards for Cesar Chavez and others during marches and protests. We were present at Cesar Chavez's funeral and Dolores Huerta and other prominent figures came full circle and were present and spoke at my father's funeral in 2009. My mother's side of the family was and is very involved in Southern California, and in particular, San Diego. My mother, Josephine Talamantes, is a co-founder of Chicano Park, was the primary author to make Chicano Park a national landmark, and is currently working hard to open the Chicano Park Museum, which is dedicated to not only preserving the history of Chicano Park, but to provide services through art and STEM programs to the community. 
Fun fact, my mom also received her master's degree the same year that I received my PhD, and we had a great party at my hooding ceremony in Texas. My parents taught me to really know myself and to know where I come from. Academic journeys in STEM fields often try to get you to forget who you are and where you come from. The academy and professional STEM spaces often teach you to assimilate, and through that assimilation, create a sense of insecurity and or desire to fit into a mold that wasn't designed for us. If we're strong enough, we rebel and push against that mold that they're trying to fit us into. Essentially, we're rebelling against the colonial practices of what, is, of what it means to do STEM and who has contributed to foundational understandings about STEM. I have lots of things that I'm a first for. However, when I remind myself of where I come from, I remind myself that my ancestors were architects, fine artists, mathematicians, astronomers, agricultural experts, poets, politicians, athletes, inclusive lovers, had space for non-binary people, and so much more. It's absolutely necessary to acknowledge our accomplishments for being first. Just remember that these aren't new spaces for us. Remembering that will give you freedom to just be who you are, that you're doing great regardless of what measures you are compared against. Being raised in an environment that centered organizing around equity laid the foundation for my most recent publication entitled The Demographics of Physics Education Research. As physics education research experts, or PER for short, myself and my friend Dr. Steve Canham are interested in understanding the teaching and learning of physics content. Our field has, for the past half century, probed student thinking, affect and identity, developed curricula and tools for measuring progress, and created theoretical models. PER's findings have been based on data collected from hundreds of thousands of students and has resulted in greater expectations within and beyond the physics community that educational progress should be solidly grounded in evidence-based scientific investigation. Both of us, due to very different reasons, started questioning whether the data that we were basing all of our conclusions about best practices or characteristics of expert-like thinking and curriculum designed to optimize learning physics was actually designed to support all people who take physics in this country. We realized that when we looked at populations like those from Cal State Dominguez Hills or SACNAS attendees, there were discrepancies. These discrepancies led to questions about how our sample population impacted our understanding of how generalizable STEM education findings are to all students. In order to assess this, we chose to look at the research published in three prominent journals in our field between 1970 and 2015. We focused only on those papers that identified the number of students in the study, the institution that the study was conducted at, and the course that the students were enrolled in. As experts, we found that our understandings were based on data collected from very homogeneous populations. Well-prepared students, affluent students, institutions that are less likely to have diverse populations, and almost completely ignored high school and community college students. This study was obvious to me, but sometimes the obvious things are the least understood. And if you don't believe me, talk to my introductory students and they'll tell you. In all seriousness, this confirms from a data perspective what I've been experiencing my entire academic career, that I often felt like I didn't belong because most of the measures that we use to categorize success are based on people that don't have any resemblance to myself. These benchmarks are based on people who came from well-prepared K-12 institutions, rarely repeated courses, who have freedom to be full-time students without working, who have always been surrounded by people who act and think like themselves, and who have never had to question if they are good enough to be a physicist. It was relieving to have data to back up what I already knew. It gave me data to reference when I was in national conversations about how we think about the physics community. This study should not only be important to practitioners of physics, but everyone in STEM fields. This study shows that the lens in which we view data is biased. When we overgeneralize data and make the assumption that curriculum that we are developing and the measures we use as best practices are supportive of everyone, we are perpetuating the biases that already exist in the educational system. It is our job as administrators, as professors, as researchers, and as students to constantly question how data is collected and if it is equitable. It's also important to use the language that matters to the decision makers. In this case, that meant doing extensive data analysis to create the story that I have always known. What I hope this study also shows is that we need to stop listening to the majority when they are telling us what we are supposed to be like. Instead, I hope that this study reminds you to have confidence in yourself, that you can recognize 
that failing a class or having a low GPA are not measures that should be used to define your potential. Being a scientist is hard, but what's harder is trying to be a scientist in a way that is not true to who you are. Listen to yourself, have confidence in yourself, and can continue to work hard for your career goals regardless of what your academic system is trying to tell you. Be great by being your true self. Thank you. Thank you.